everybody. Thank you for coming. I'm Jamie Court. I'm president of Consumer Watchdog. And uh, with me is Lisa Tucker with Consumer Watchdog. And on the line is Mike Aguirre, who is uh, the former city attorney of San Diego and, and, and uh, a San Diego attorney who's fought to liberate uh, emails related to the Public Utility Commission corruption scandal involving the Governor Brown administration. It's been instrumental in bringing forth to the public record uh, information that leads to the trail that tells us why uh, we are having so many problems at the Public Utility Commission and how it relates back to the Brown administration. Today we're here because public officials are not supposed to make public decisions or be involved in public decisions when their personal finances are at issue. And we've uncovered evidence through Public Records Act requested emails that the top aide to Governor Brown, Nancy McFadden, has indeed uh, been involved in making decisions related to her stock portfolio. So, when the Brown administration began in 2011, January 2011, Nancy McFadden was tapped as executive secretary, the top aide to the governor. She held hundreds of thousands of dollars in stock in Pacific Gas and Electric. She also left Pacific Gas and Electric with a million dollars as a severance payment. And during the time, there had been a brutal explosion in San Bruno that had rocked a neighborhood and killed eight people. This had happened in the fall before the uh, changing of the guard. And as soon as the Brown administration came in, public utility commission appointments were up for grabs. Governor Brown on January 25th appointed what seemed to be two pro-consumer appointees to the commission, Commissioner Florio and Sandoval. And days later, actually as that appointment occurred, we saw the stock plummet. That led to a series of emails between PG&E's lobbyist Brian Cherry and PUC Commissioner President Michael Peavy. And these emails finger Nancy McFadden as the go-to person in the Brown administration for appointments of a utility commission commissioner in order to help bolster PG&E stock and help the company recover. The discussion is very explicit and it's also confirmed by interviews with people in the Capitol that show that Nancy McFadden has been involved in making decisions related to PG&E in the legislature and in the appointments process. So I want to take a look at these emails, but what happened was, if you go back one, Cody, on the chart we have with us, uh, on the chart, these are all evidence in our FPPC complaint that was filed on Friday. We have on the 27th, as the stock goes down, um, communications between PV and Cherry we're gonna share. And you'll see that the stock continues to fall, and this is a chart of the stock price of, of Pacific Gas and Electric, until there's a new pro-utility appointment in March of Mark Farron, and then the stock starts to take off again. And this period of time is the period of time we're looking at right now. So if we go to the first of the emails, this email is an email that's really remarkable because it shows that uh, if we scroll down, um, there is a forwarding from, uh, from uh, PG&E's lobbyist Brian Cherry of investor reports about PG&E stock plummeting along with Edison stock and the investors now saying we're gonna go to, to a hold from a buy. And uh, what Cherry basically says to PV is, we need to do something about this. And PV says, this information should go to the governor's office, probably best to Nancy McGeff. Jerry has to be made aware that actions have consequences. And in the next series of uh, emails, we go to the next one, we see that Brian Sherry acknowledges having talked to McFadden. Nancy asks us if you have any names you'd like to recommend, you can call her directly as you, if you like. This uh, is an email that says, in regard to utility commission appointments, which was what the discussion was prior to the emails, Nancy is the person in the governor's office to go to. Go to the next slide. This is actually a discussion of specific people 
who are going to be put forth by PG&E as potential commissioner candidates, again, to bolster the stock price. And Sherry says, FYI, Nancy has it now, the resume. It says, attached is the, my bio. Let me know if there's any additional information needed. And Sherry says, Nancy has it now. Go to the next slide, please. This is a slide, by the way, that sets up uh, this whole chain of events uh, because um, in this slide we see, this is when Nancy McFadden is first appointed, January 5th, and she's in charge of appointments and legislation according to this public press release. The next uh, email exchange is from PV and Sherry in which uh, Sherry says, uh, yes, good news. Um, so there's basically, to go to the next slide, a series of uh, slides, and I, I don't know if we actually have to put, them, put, put one up, but there's a series of emails, these are just to highlight, that, that show that Sherry and Peavy discuss McFadden as the point person in the administration. And one particular exchange that uh, hasn't made the light of day till today, which is an exchange between Sherry and a potential ratepayer advocate appointee. Uh, to uh, to the uh, to the position it would be a, a gubernatorial position, and uh, let me just get the wording on this. Do you have the press release with you? No. Okay. We grab me a copy press release. Um, the third. It's on the third page of the press release, and it's it's a quote that says this from Sherry to this potential appointee uh, of the rate per advocate. Sherry says. Typically support letters coming from the utilities or the kiss of death for appointments. We never do it for commissioner appointments. Instead, we go the back door route. I'd be happy to do that with Nancy, but I'm not sure a letter would be advantageous to you given the mess around San Bruno, your choice. Again, McFadden's name comes up time and again as the person in the governor's office to go to. And there's some very extensive emails between Sherry and Peavy that we can uh, also make available. Um, this is all part of the exhibits on our complaint, which is available at consumerwatchdog.org. But there's some extensive emails laying out a list of five candidates for the commissioner's position uh, that are being vetted allegedly by Ms. McFadden. So uh, what I would say uh, before I let uh, Lisa walk through some of the, the financial evidence in the question of what kind of legislative deliberations McFadden took part in is this. The governor's office produced a Public Records Act request that said there are no records showing Nancy McFadden recused herself from deliberations on PG&E in the appointment or the legislative process. McFadden has an obligation to show that she recused herself or to step down because the Political Reform Act very clearly says you cannot make a public decision and have a financial interest in the outcome. And in this appointments process and in the evidence you can hear about legislative process, McFadden was in charge of appointments and legislation and she had a financial in the interest in the outcome and the people who worked with her had to know she could not be making decisions related to those issues or she should not be holding this office. A recusal requires uh, a, a, a public notice, and I'll let Mike talk about uh, this as well. Uh, a recusal requires that a uh, public official publicly notify their colleagues that they're not going to be part of a decision. Absent that recusal, she has violated the law, and she needs to leave this office. And the governor needs to take this as a serious matter, because this is all about corruption at his doorstep. So uh, maybe I'll let Lisa briefly go through these documents and, and then we'll let Mike talk a little about the larger context of what was happening at the PUC and the governor's office at the time. So these are her statement of uh, economic interest, 700 forms. Uh, all, all public officials have to file. And um, as you see, she came in uh, in 2010 uh, with up to a million dollars in stock options in two companies. One was PG&E. The other one was Lynn Energy, which is a natural gas producer and fracker. Uh, can I go to the next slide? Um, okay. So here uh, in uh, 2012, she's reduced her holdings to up to $100,000 in PG&E and up to $100,000 in Lynn Energy. 
Uh, she does not indicate, as you will notice, as she's supposed to, what she, uh, you know, what she unloaded, what she got for it, uh, when she did, she did these financial transactions, so we really don't know. But we know that she also held uh, these options through 2012. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, she claims that her PG&E stock options were sold sometime in 2012, but this actually is her 2013. She signed this in 2013. So uh, it's not clear to me uh, why we didn't have it actually on the form, but we don't know why. Okay, so uh, and, 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 that, then, and that is a violation of, that's political, a violation, of right. political reform act, right? And not, then, not to adequately disclose your uh, timing of your sale or the value of your sale doesn't let the public see whether you sold them as an insider. Here's a woman who had access to information about the San Bruno investigation. She could have sold these in a way to maximize her profit based on public information, and we don't know that because she has failed to comply with the Political Reform Act and tell us when she sold those stocks specifically, what day, and how much she uh, got because of the sale right. of those shares. So she claims she divested everything in PG&E sometime in 2012. She retained, however, stock options in Lynn uh, up to 10000 Again, we don't know when she disposed of what uh, through 2013. So uh, again, she's, she's violating the act. Um, at the same time, what I'd like to point out is that this investigation does bear broadening into her role in legislation. So in the 2011-2012 uh, uh, cycle, uh, we had uh, at least nine pieces of legislation introduced um, uh, to improve safety in the wake of San Bruno, install things like, you know, um, uh, safety valves, uh, increase fines, um, you know, make the transmission system safer. And um, one of them in particular, which was signed in September 2012, was very interesting, um, AB 861. Uh, it was vociferously opposed by PG&E and other utilities. And basically what it did was in substantially increase penalties on utility companies for safety problems. But it also featured a clawback provision. And that allowed utilities to recover so-called excess compensation incentive pay from uh, high officials in, the, in these companies if um, an accident happened on their watch. It was basically structured so that if there was a violation issued that the utilities could claw back that excess compensation um, up to five years before the decision was made on what the fine was going to be. And um, that mysteriously disappeared within the space of a couple of weeks. Um, we know she was a point person uh, in, in, in the governor's office on all this legislation, and it was very, very interesting that it just kind of um, went away. She would have, of course, been subject to the clawback of her incentive pay, maybe even the $1 million bonus. Uh, because of the circumstances under which she left, uh, they still would have been able to recover it. So that's, that was gone, and the fines were substantially weakened, just substantially weakened. And then it was left up to the utility whether or not they wanted to try to claw back anything. In other words, they're given complete discretion on what to do about executive pay and whether or not ratepayers pay for it. So that was that was pretty egregious. And then the other thing was with fracking legislation. We did have fracking legislation moving um, in the uh, in the. Um, let me just quickly look at this. Uh, we had fracking legislation also moving in uh, 2012, 2013. There were at least maybe half a dozen of those. And again, we don't know when she divested her Lynn stock uh, or what the implications were of those trades. So, so the essence of this is that as legislation as an executive secretary in charge of legislation appointments, there was multitude of legislation affecting her stock holdings and no record she recused herself on any of it. One of the bills would specifically affect how much she got in severance and stock options. There's no record of recusal. And we know the governor did not sign the bill with that provision intact. So this is something the FPPC has to look at. I want to turn it over to Mike Aguirre, uh, who uh, couldn't make it up from San Diego. But uh, I know as, as city attorney has some uh, important perspectives on what recusal means and also important perspectives having been in this uh, PCC corruption scandal from the beginning. Uh, Mike, do you want to uh, weigh in a little here on, 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 the, on the complaint that sure. we filed? Thank you. Right. Uh, first of all, I want to uh, thank everyone for uh, that's on the phone and that, that's there for allowing us to uh, make this presentation to you. And I also want to acknowledge uh, the role of the Sacramento Bee and the Smart Meter Harm uh, that did a lot of work uh, as well uh, previously uh, addressing some of these issues. The uh, after having spent uh, really hundreds and hundreds of hours reviewing the email traffic back and forth 
between Wall Street uh, power players and the commission and seeing that the commissioners regularly go to uh, Wall Street, uh, regularly have Wall Street players come uh, to the commission in large droves, uh, and then massive amounts of information that goes out from the PUC to the Wall Street insiders that have uh, interest in uh, the utilities and represent the substantial players uh, that invested in the utilities. Uh, it's pretty clear to see that uh, Wall Street is very much in control of the CPUC. And when Jerry Brown was first appointed, that control, uh, which had been exercised through PV, who was very closely aligned with these Wall Street players, that control was uh, put at risk. And taking a page out of the bailout uh, playbook, wherein uh, the rating agencies and the investment banking community used the threat of downgrades uh, to extort and pressure the government to do the bailout. The same was done here beginning in early January 2011, and the evidence and then the work that uh, Consumer Watchdog has uncovered uh, parallels uh, with the work that we've done uh, on this as well. And so what happened was that PV, working with these Wall Street insiders, started orchestrating uh, with uh, PG&E uh, the threat uh, to the Brown administration that if they allowed the CPC to revert back to what it was supposed to be, which is an agency that guarantees just and reasonable rates, that they would be punished uh, with uh, lowering from buy to hold uh, and, 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 and ensuing from, uh, from that would be uh, decreases in the stock prices. The, the prices went down a, a re, you know, not not a great deal. I know Jamie said they they plummeted, but uh, one more. that's true. In, but but in but in, but in in but in but in in, in 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 that's true in the sense that that that's what they that they were giving them a head fake or, or showing them that that's where things were headed, and they gave them a little taste. Uh, that all came back to Nancy McFadden, who was very closely aligned with PG&E. Uh, she had been their principal uh, legislative player on the Hill. Uh, she had uh, carried uh, the case against Proposition, or in favor of Proposition 16, which would have wiped out uh, public power. Uh, and she was a uh, Sacramento uh, power player for pg and &E. And upon her, uh, just before she took office with Jerry in January the 5th of uh, 2011, uh, she received a, a million dollars and promised in a written agreement uh, basically to not do anything that would uh, directly or indirectly harm pg and &E. So where we are today is that this information has been suppressed. It hasn't been censored, but it has been suppressed. This should be front page story across the state. And the reason for that is that uh, this is in large measure an explanation for why we don't have just and reasonable rates. We have the highest, uh, amongst the highest utility rates in the country. Uh, even in cases such as San Onofre and San Bruno, uh, where people should have been brought to justice, uh, these Wall Street interests led by former Commissioner Farron, who was the Wall Street pick that got put in there to make sure that uh, the commission stayed under PV's uh, control. Uh, they, they did not take effective action on San Bruno nor San Onofre. Uh, and in the case of San Onofre, Mr. Picker, in June 23 and 24 of 2014, made a deal with Wall Street basically to uh, allow or to require the ratepayers to pay the $3 billion that uh, they are now paying for the defunct plant. And that's in addition to the decommissioning $4 million. $4 billion. So that's where we are. Uh, we really hope that uh, the specificity and the remarkable nature of these emails, and there's going to be many more coming out in the next few days uh, on these broader issues, but we just hope uh, that our more uh, investigative uh, press members uh, will see the, the significance of this and get this written on the front pages. Uh, not buried in the back part of of the newspapers, but uh, hey, Mike, put on the front pages where it needs to be. And hey, Mike, can you uh, just do, do uh, like uh, just a, a few sentences about the issue of recusal as a lawyer who's involved in this from the San yeah. Diego City Attorney point? And what what a recusal means in the context of the law, and and what would be a right. legal recusal and not an illegal recusal? 
or a failure to reduce. Well, the, the, the common law of uh, public service, as with the common law of uh, service on a corporate board of directors, uh, requires uh, undivided loyalty. And uh, if there is a uh, question of uh, the potential for divided loyalty, there's an obligation uh, to not put yourself in that position. So in the case of, of, of uh, Ms. McFadden, uh, she had a fiduciary duty to the people of California, to the state of California, uh, not to put herself in a potential for uh, a conflict. It's not that she actually had to uh, violate a conflict or actually act uh, in violation of, uh, of a trusted position. But the conflict law draws the line at the point where you can't put yourself in that position to begin with. We don't, we under the conflict law don't want you to be in a position where you have the temptation. And so the line is drawn and it says, don't put yourself in that position. Uh, in her situation, uh, she did not recuse herself. And recusal, there, it's one, it, 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 her, there's certain types of recusals. One type of recusal is statutory recusal. She, she's not an elected official, so she doesn't, uh, or a certain type of appointed official. She doesn't fall into that category, but she falls more into the category of being an agent of the governor. And so uh, her, her conflict is as if the governor had the same conflict because he is her agent. And for her to then, as his agent, exercise or put herself in position where she was receiving names for possible appointments when she uh, those names were being uh, pushed to keep the stock prices high, to, to rebound the stock and to restore the control of the PUC or maintain it in PV's hands, uh, that went way beyond just failing to recuse, which she had an obligation to do. But she, she actually crossed over the line and got herself involved uh, in actually using influence. Uh, if we can read all the circumstantial evidence correctly, that the ultimate person that was appointed was, in fact, an investment banker for 25 years from Deutsche Bank, uh, Mark Farron, and who, in fact, carried the message of Wall Street uh, on, in uh, October the uh, in October of 2014, wherein he argued that uh, the CPC should go lightly uh, on San Bruno and lightly on San Onofre uh, or uh, Wall Street, according to uh, three groups of investors that he identified as representing uh, $3 trillion, would retaliate by making uh, us have to pay more for the CPC to have to pay more, the utilities have to pay more for the money that they were uh, borrowing. So, so on the gov just so we're clear, on California Government Code Section 87100, it prohibits a public official from using her official position to influence a government decision in which she knows or has reason to know she has a financial issue. And public official, as the governor's office, I think, is acknowledged by saying she didn't participate in the decision, applies to McFadden. Now, there are specific people who have to make a written record of their recusal in writing, which is a separate government code that the governor's office uh, claims does not apply to her because she's not an elected well, official. And we're not necessarily yeah. making the claim that that position provides her, but right. what we are claiming is she had a common law responsibility as a fiduciary oh. to make that disclosure. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I was, so I was just asking, is, is, uh, Mike, is, is, is again, this, this issue of recusal, what constitutes a recusal? Because I think we're, even the governor's office acknowledged she has to recuse. Can she just say, I'm going to recuse, or does she have to have an official, uh, does she have well, to uh, uh, the, let people know this, in, in, given your experience? The, the, point of, the point of recusal has to be a reasonable recusal, given the facts and circumstances of the position involved. So, for example, if uh, there are those around her that may bring her case, uh, bring her issues such as uh, Mr. Cherry or uh, Mr. Peavy, the circle of people that she is likely to receive uh, those kinds of uh, entrees uh, need to be informed. And, and typically, uh, in order to show that you've in fact complied, uh, if she was given any kind of legal advice at all, would be in a written format. When you do it the way that has been done here, this is exactly uh, what the law prohibits because it leaves it open. And uh, you have to come back and try to sort it out. And this is why the line is drawn 
uh, that prohibits people putting themselves to the position to begin with. So you don't have to go through all of this. You don't have to go through whether she had told people and didn't tell people. She, there should be a written record of her telling the people that are most immediately around her with uh, Mr. Peavy or, or ahead of time in anticipation of potential problems or at the time of any inquiry to her, she should have documented immediately uh, her recusal and admonished uh, Mr. Peavy and Mr. Cherry not to contact her about uh, these matters. And, and, we, and, we, and we'd like to, we, what we're challenging the governor today is to produce such a written record or any evidence that she recused herself because uh, absent that, uh, this really requires her to step down. So we got